Thank you for joining us today for the spatial modeling for wildlife applications using FLIR imagery and RDOS Imagine webinar. Spatial modeling for wildlife applications. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about FLIR imagery and RDAS Imagine. Um, the nexus of this exercise or this WebEx came out of a class that I did over at the National Conservation Training Center for the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, where we were taking uh, an artificial intelligence uh, approach to be able to count uh, to count things. And the question was, can you count birds? And looking at the example I have on the screen right now is an awful lot of cormorants sitting on that rock outside of uh, the Oregon coast. And the question was, how do I go about counting those? And you can do it with the naked eye pretty easy. Trying to do it with AI really wasn't an option. And what we wanted to do was look at a solution in order to make that a possibility so that your intern or you or anybody else could actually go on in and just get rid of the monotonous task and actually work on a simple count uh, and get back to the, to the really important things as opposed to the, the real tedious. So when I looked at it, we started taking a look at FLIR imagery. Uh, FLIR imagery is, you know, we take some thermal imagery cameras, cameras uh, very easy to see through the darkness. You don't have any of the visual camouflage that you need to worry about. Um, doesn't really require any light in order to go through it. And a lot of things that we're looking at, especially in the wildlife populations, they're nocturnal. So they're either active at night or they're roosting, and you're wanting to be able to go ahead and count those, but it's real hard to detect them uh, without having a thermal camera. So that's, this is a really good way to go ahead and do that. And the other nice thing is, too, is you know, we can look at things in all kind of weather conditions as opposed to just really crisp EO conditions or electro-optical conditions to go ahead and look at stuff. So that's the first part of the solution. What we want to do then is take the Imagine Spatial Model and go ahead and do that one. And This is the model that we're going to go through today. I'm going to pick it apart, uh, let you build the whole thing as we go through, and then I'll run a live demo when we're done with it. But what we want to be able to do is to take the imagery, run it against this model, come up with a very simple solution to say, I've got X number of birds, and then move on to more important things. So when we look at FLIR imagery, this example we're looking at right now is over the Platte River. Uh, it's a nighttime image, and I've got a whole bunch of birds roosting in the river. Now, as I look at this one, normally uh, the hot spots are going to be bright and the dark spots, uh, you know, the cold, cooler temperatures are going to be dark. In this case, because the birds are sitting on the water, there are going to be dark spots on top of the water because it's a nighttime image of water cools, cools a little uh, slower than, than uh, everything else does. So that's a, just a one way to look at it. But all we're really looking about here is being able to have some differentiation between the two and then do what's called a level slice in order to figure out that temperature range in order to figure out how to, how to count those birds. Now, we could count these very easy with the naked eye. I can even make it easier yet if I was to take that image and do what's uh, called like an image chain and run those colors up behind it. Uh, just throw any colors behind it, and then the spots for those birds that we're looking at, all those sandhill cranes, show up very easy to go ahead and count with the naked eye. Again, one way to do it, but it's not totally automated. And what we want to be able to do now is automate the process to make it very simple. So how do we do that? The first thing we have to do is we've got to build a spatial model. And when we look at a spatial model, I think the easiest way to visualize a spatial model is consider it a word problem. Things that we learned back in grade school or junior high is, you know, go ahead and write it down to figure out where all your variables are and then to come up with a solution. So if I look at this problem, what I want to be able to do is I want to count the sandhill cranes on the river. So with the naked eye, I can physically count them, but on the imagery, somehow we kind of got to make a selection in here. And when you look at the imagery, there's two variables that we need to consider. One is the relative size of that uh, of the bird, and then the other one is the temperature band that we want to go ahead and grab. 
So if we can go ahead and sort those out, we can do a very easy piece to it. Now, these two, the image that we're looking at here happens to be a mosaic, so it's not quite as easy as being able to go on in and saying, just, you know, give me everything that's, I don't know, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and just head, head, head and grab that one. What we want to be able to do is now we're not going to have to query the imagery in order to figure out what temperature band I want because those numbers aren't necessarily absolute values. So when we look at it, you know, we looked at that image chain, brought it in, and now I'm going to zoom on into the pixel level. Really kind of crazy, not a view that most of us actually go on and do, but when you zoom into the pixel level, I can count and I can see that each individual bird probably runs somewhere around six, seven, eight, nine pixels, depending upon if it's a large bird, if it's a small bird, if he's got his head tucked under his wing, however you want to look at it, there is going to be some variation here, but I can go on in and I can get a definitive range, and I can also see that most of the time they're not necessarily clumped together, there is some separation between them. So I can go ahead and get that in there pretty good. The next thing that I want to look at, too, is the inquire cursor. And what the inquire cursor does is it gives me a value for those pixels. So I place the inquire cursor on the center of one of the pixels, these green squares as we're looking at them. It gives me a value. I hit that same value on the next square and the next square and the next bird. And then what I can do is I can take an average, and that becomes my, my level slice for that, uh, that we're trying to go ahead and figure out for our spatial model. A real easy way to go ahead and do that to figure out those variables. So now as I've looked at it, I've got a size figured out, and I have a temperature figured out. Now all I have to do is be able to count them. Okay. So when we look at Imagine a Spatial Model, we've got – close to 500 different operators out there. And the question is, how do we put all of those operators together to go ahead and look at things? What I want to be able to do with a spatial model is I want to be able to make it so that it's usable by anybody, all right? I don't want to have to have just the expert be able to run it, but I want the expert to go ahead and be able to give tags so that I can say what's my upper temperature and what's my lower temperature so that even an intern can run that for you. We'll do a lot of mathematical things. Is the temperature greater than this? Is it less than this? Or is the clump size greater than this? Is it less than that? Does it fit everything in the middle for a logical and? Do I want to be able to clump all those values together because raster, unlike vector, is a bunch of individual pixels, and what we want to be able to do is clump those pixels together and then have a count. From that count, do I want to do – I want to be able to go through all of those. I want to be able to convert my result from a raster to a vector. I want to be able to set things thematically. So things like this, when we look at it, we really want to be able to go ahead and take those values and put them together. And the nice thing about Imagine is when you look at any one of these operators, there are going to be examples on how to use those. And then the really, really important thing on this uh, whole list of operators over here is the one called Preview. Because what Preview does is it lets you try different variables so that you can go ahead and run those, look at the results, tweak your results, and run it again. So that's a real good way to start looking at things. And what I'm going to do with the next couple of slides is I'm going to build on how we go through, through putting them together and show you just how easy that complex model that we saw up front was to write. So when we look at it, the first thing we need to be able to do, group the light temp temperatures. So the first variable that I would put in is the raster input. In other words, that thermal image or the FLIR image that I looked at. Okay, I give that thermal image a label. That becomes the blank, fill in the blank when I want to go ahead and run that. A less than and a greater than symbol, my upper and my lower temperature. A logical and is everything within the middle of that. And then clump them. 
That seems to be a real easy way or a subroutine that we would put within the model to go ahead and run. And it doesn't take a programmer's IQ in order to put this together. It's this very simple model to understand and see when we're going to go ahead and grab that one. The next thing what we need to be able to do is we need to take those clumps and we need to filter them on size by size because I may have clumps outside the water that may be groups of trees or I may have, I don't know, you know, a bear sitting on the bank to go ahead and say how big is that and it may be too big for me to go ahead and do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those clumps and I'm going to go through every one of those clumps. So that's the nth item that we're looking at over here. And then again, I'll have an upper clump size and a lower clump size. That logical and, and we'll just keep running it on through the process again. So again, now I've got temperature and my clump size. And then the next thing that I need to be able to do is to go ahead and take that to a binary raster and then to a shape file. So when we go ahead and take that clump, it's either a bird or not a bird. So we have those two, we've got a binary raster, but what we want to be able to do is now is make that a thematic. Convert that to the thematic, boom. Now I know that I've got two classes, either bird or non-bird. That becomes a shape file. I define my shape file attributes, how big it is, and what my clump size is. And in this case, what I was also looking at is well, you know, maybe when we're looking at this, I'll have one bird roosting so close to another bird where there might be two there. So I'll have a threshold that says this is two birds versus one bird so that I can make sure I get my count correct. Plain and simple, look at that one when we're done. And now the process becomes to run the model. And this is what we call debugging and tweaking, a real easy way to go ahead and do that where you now look at it, you've got your model written, and then we want to see, we want to test it. This is where that preview comes on in, and when we're looking at it, you'll also see a whole bunch of green check marks. If they're not green check marks, they're going to be red X's, and that'll tell you where the project or where your special model failed so that you can go back in and debug it. But a real nice way to look at it and then see just on top of it, that shapefile shows up on top of the image. I can now do my sanity check in order to go, did I get it right? Didn't I get it right? Do I need to address the thresholds of either size or temperature just a little bit in order to tweak that? Once we've got that done, we're done and we're really easy to go ahead and do that one. Now, looking at the model, when you say run, it's not trying to run that whole model that we saw to begin with. It's going to give you a very nice GUI, or basically a graphic user interface. So all of those blanks that I had, remember that thermal image tag, and my upper temperature and my lower temperature, these all become variables to you to, for you to plug in. And then when we're done with that, we run it, we'll see that shape file. We open up the attributes on the shape file. It tells me I've got 322 actual polygons, and out of those, several of them had two in there, so I had 345 birds within my image. A real nice way to go ahead and check, see what you're done having the whole problem. Now, normally what I would do at this time is I would open it up for questions. Uh, what I'm going to do before I do that, Matt, is I'd like to go ahead and actually run a simple model, let everybody see how easy it is to go ahead and work. So let me escape out of my PowerPoint presentation over here. I can get out of it. All righty. And I go back over to Erdas Imagine. So within Erdas Imagine, what I now have is that spatial model that I built. You can actually see where I've got the thermal image as far as my input, my lower temp, my upper temp, and so forth. And then every time you run this, it's going to cache those values for you. So now all I have to do is hit my preview command, and it's going to bring up that nice interface. It says, there's the image that I want to use, my upper and lower temperatures, what I actually had done in my queries. I'm going to call the bird map my WebEx demo. I'm going to say, OK. And we notice how it goes on through and checks all those boxes, quickly gave me a polygon of everything that I have over here. I can open a raster layer. I can hit my recent button because I had 
looked at my birds before, drop that in there, say, okay, move it down, and now when we look at it, color isn't exactly the straightest, but we can see where those birds fit within our image and actually go ahead and do that count. It's very simply, it's a cable, that tabular attribute query to check out the rest of the pieces to work stuff, but I think in actuality, it's a very nice product, a solid product to go ahead and work with. So what I'd like to do now is to take this from the overall look and the running of the, uh, things. Come back, see Matt, what kind of comments or questions did we have during our WebEx over here? Yes, Jeff. Good job. We did get a, a couple of questions. One question was, in addition to analyzing bird populations, what other tasks can you make uh, use of FLIR and Erdos Imagine? So, you know, Matt, when I look at this, I'm trying to think, you know, I, I did this on a wildlife application. Uh, I did it for birds and really made sense. Uh, if you wanted to do migration of caribou across Alaska, if you wanted to figure out maybe a, a wild horse population across Nevada, we can do that one. Uh, if you wanted to take it, outside of the wildlife arena and you were just trying to look at FLIR imagery and you wanted to say, I've got a boat harbor, I can tell you which engines have been run very recently, which ones haven't been. So anything that you've got a differentiation where you see the heat against the land or the water and you want to go ahead and count those, that's where FLIR imagery really shines. Great. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, one other question that came in. Uh, somebody liked how the spatial model looked. They said it looked very versatile. Uh, they're, they're asked, are there other spatial models that can be built and applied to improve workflows for similar projects? That spatial model is extremely versatile, extremely easy to use. Uh, and when you look at the spatial model, um, a number of our commands within RS Match, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to things like uh, uh, normalized differentiated uh, vegetative index and NDVI. If you, if you ever use it, there's a little button that says view, and what it'll do is it'll let you view that spatial model to go ahead and look at stuff. So doing that, anything that you can put the math to, you can do that. So if I needed to do that vegetative index, if I needed to do a water index, if I needed to count birds, if I needed to do, um, oh, things like uh, pan sharpening of imagery, Literally anything that you can go ahead and put pen to paper to write the word problem for, you can actually write into a spatial model. Uh, like I said, there's about 500 different operators to go ahead and choose from. And in addition to that, you can also uh, incorporate, say, a, either a Python script or a command line interface. 